first today from uh, Carwan Bhopal, Professor of Education, Social Justice, and Director of the Center for Research in Race and Education at the University of Birmingham. Uh, she's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and a visiting professor at Harvard and at King's College London. Carwan's research focuses on the achievements and experiences of minority ethnic groups in education. She's conducted research on exploring discourses of identity and intersectionality, examining the lives of black minority ethnic groups, as well as examining the marginal position of Roma and travelers. Her research specifically explores how processes of racism, exclusion, and marginalization operate in predominantly white spaces with a focus on social justice and inclusion. Her most recent book is White Privilege, The Myth of a Post-Racial Society. I'm delighted we've got Carl with us today, virtually, as her research has been very influential in supporting the recognition in Ireland that gender equality has been prioritised in higher education over other equality grounds, especially with respect to race, an issue we need urgently to address in Ireland. I've long been keen, keen to hear Carwin speak, uh, but a first event scheduled for Dublin last year was postponed due to industrial action. A second in London uh, in March last year was cancelled due to the pandemic. So third time lucky, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Carwin to speak to us today about the Unequal Academy, the experiences of black and minority ethnic, ethnic academics, which is the topic of a book she published in 2016. Carwin, welcome. We look forward to what you have to say to us. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction. And it is a pleasure to be here. I'm just gonna put my slides on the screen. Okay, so thank you very much indeed for inviting me to, I was going to say Dublin, but virtually to Dublin, um, and giving me the opportunity to talk about my work today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the experiences of black and minority ethnic academics in higher education. So I think it's really important, first of all, to start with policy making. And obviously I'm going to focus on the UK. Um, because my knowledge isn't as good um, as Ireland, but I'm sure you have very similar policies in Ireland. In fact, I, I, I know that you do. So in the UK, the widening participation agenda was introduced back in 1999, and this was carried forward by the new Labour government and subsequent coalition and conservative governments. The widening participation agenda has been hugely influential because it gave access to marginalised students to, so that in order that they could attend higher education. We've also had the Race Relations Amendment Act, which is also a very important piece of legislation. Why it is relevant is because it introduced the definition of institutional racism. We had the Equality Act, which was introduced in 2010. The Equality Act is important because it includes protected characteristics of which race is one. We've also had policy initiatives such as the Athena Swan Charter and the Race Equality Charter. What's particularly interesting about the Athena Swan Charter and the Race Equality Charter, which I argue, is that historically through policy making, and this has been reinforced through the Athena Swan Charter, is that gender has been given precedence over race, which is what um, Colin alluded to in his int introduction. And I argue in my work that the main beneficiaries of the Athena Swan Charter have been white middle class women. And just going back to the, the Race Equality Charter, the differences between the Race Equality Charter and Athena Swan is that Athena Swan it can, is departmental and institutional. The Race Equality Charter is much newer and it's only institutional. It was introduced in 2016 and there are currently 75 Race Equality Charter members of which 17 hold a bronze award. So once institutions apply for the Race Equality Charter, they have to, sorry, once they become members, they have to apply for it within three years of that membership. So in higher education, we have seen some significant changes. So we've seen an increase in the numbers of black and minority ethnic students attending higher education institutions, but we've also seen a significant increase in the number of staff. I, I understand and agree that the concept of BME is a problematic and highly contested term. And I accept that there are differences within and between those different groups. And it's important to recognize that, and I'm aware of that. So I argue that whilst there have been these significant increases in the student body in relation to staff and students, and we have had significant advances in policy making, but, but despite this, inequalities in higher education around race continue 
to persist. So let's look at the staff demographics. So the most recent data from 2020 shows us that 9.4% of UK staff identified as being from a black or minority ethnic background. But, and the proportion of staff has actually increased, as I've argued. So it's increased from 4.8 to 8.2. So it's so roughly doubled, actually. However, there's inequalities within that, that those staff demographics. So only 3.1% of BME staff are heads of institutions. And the majority of professors are white and a very small number of professors are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. And higher proportions of white academics are more likely disproportionately more likely to be on the highest pay spine of £59,000 or more compared to BME staff. So let's look at the professors group. The reason why the professors group is really, really important is because that tra trajectory or career trajectory within higher education, once you achieve level six or professor, that is in some ways the highest grade that one can achieve. So if you look at the most recent statistics, they show us that the total number of BME professors is 1,390. So the majority of professors are white. And if you break down that category, you can see there that from the BME category, it is the black groups that are the most disadvantaged. So we have slightly higher numbers for the other groups, but black groups continue to be disadvantaged. So my argument is that throughout policy making, for staff and students indeed, Whilst the BME category as a whole is disadvantaged, within that it's black academics that continue to be the most disadvantaged. And this is the most recent statistics from 2020. And believe it or not, these statistics are actually better than they, slightly better than they were 10 years ago, but still not as good as we would like them. So why is this happening? So we have an assumption, don't we, that universities are liberal, progressive, they have social justice at the heart of their agenda. However, there's a huge amount of quantitative and qualitative evidence that shows us that processes of racism, exclusion and marginalisation continue to persist, not just for staff, but also for students. So staff have stereotypes of students, so white middle class students are seen as ideal. Chinese students are seen as quiet and passive and black and Muslim students are seen as loud, challenging and aggressive. And we know that there are processes of unconscious and indeed conscious bias, which continues to persist in higher education, where there are not just expectations around stereotypes from students, but also from staff. And that this continues to take place through the persistence of microaggressions and other forms of social exclusion. So I want to talk a little bit about white privilege. Um, I draw on the work of, white, of Peggy McIntosh, which I, which I know is dated, but Peggy McIntosh gives a beautiful explanation of white, what white privilege is. And she argues that it's like an invisible, weightless rapsack, knapsack that we carry, that white people carry on their back. And within that, there are special privileges. So it, they can include maps, passbooks, code books, etc. So white privilege means that you can walk through customs without being stopped. White privilege means you can park your car without being stopped by the police. White privilege means that you can go into a park and have a barbecue without someone phoning, phoning the police on you. So white privilege exists in many different forms through, through all our structures. And as Derek Bell argues, that racist hierarchical structures govern all political, economic and social domains. He argues that such, such structures allocate the privileging of whites in all arenas, including our own, of education. However, in my work, I argue that there are different shades of whiteness and white privilege. So there's acceptable and unacceptable forms, legitimate and illegitimate forms. So for example, some gypsy and traveler groups define themselves as white. So although they are white, they do not have those privileges afforded to whiteness and white middle class identities. So now I'd like to talk about my research on black and minority ethnic academics that I carried out in 2016. And I also revisited this for my book, White Privilege, where I spoke again to uh, black and minority ethnic academics. And back in 2016, this was a, a new area and there was very little research. Uh, exploring um, the trajectories, if you like, of black and minority ethnic academics. So I wanted to look at how they were positioned in the academy and particularly how they used 
social support mechanisms, particularly networking and mentoring, and how that worked in terms of affecting their career progression, and whether processes of exclusion and marginalization worked to hinder or provide roadblocks in terms of reaching those significant career, career trajectories to professor. So I conducted 65 in-depth uh, semi-structured interviews. Um, I was very keen to make a comparison with the US. Uh, I accept that the US has different social, economic and political climate to the UK, but the comparisons were really important, particularly in looking at the ways in which blackness or black identity was defined and the ways in which the situation in the US is different because there is a black academic elite and there are degrees that specifically focus on black history and they are historically black universities and colleges. So my, my understanding or hypothesis, if you like, that that notion of identity and understanding the discourse around the positioning of uh, black academics within the academy, the white space of the academy would actually be different. So I conducted face-to-face -face telephone and Skype interviews. Uh, my ethics uh, forms were, uh, uh, the GDPR was not um, actually introduced then, but they were, they were accepted. Um, what was particularly interesting about this piece of research is that many of my interviewees, many of the respondents felt that it was therapeutic um, and they said that it gave voice to their experiences, especially around discussing racism. However, as a researcher, and I've written about this elsewhere, that quite often that when uh, respondents say that they review um, their own experience and see it as therapeutic, one thinks about their own position as a researcher and the fact that I'm not a social worker, um, I'm not a psychologist, um, I'm only a researcher. So that, that's something that I found extremely interesting around, particularly around giving voice to a minority group. So the interviews were um, recorded and transcribed and they were analysed using um, grounded theory. Um, and again, uh, th this notion of identity and positionality in the research process was really important to me, particularly around the perspective that I took of being a feminist researcher and using a black feminist epistemology to understand these experiences. Um, and the notion of power itself was very interesting. So in relation to that, the dynamics of power shifted. Um, and I argue that power itself is not static, it's dynamic. It changes in different situations and at different times. So in this project, in some instances, it was clear that I had the power because I was holding the clipboard, I was asking the questions. In other instances, the respondents had the power because they could withdraw information or they may be telling me what I wanted to hear. So I was particularly interested in looking at the ethics of trust and the ethics of power, especially because it was about racism and race. So what did I find? Well, what was particularly interesting and fascinating about the research was that um, something, again, one could argue isn't new, um, is that they had this um, almost a schizophrenic identity of being both outsiders and insiders. They didn't feel as though they were accepted in the white space of the academy. Um, women especially talked about, as Goffman talks about the presentation of self um, in his fantastic work, and, and many of the women talked about the presentation of their, the, themselves, in particularly in how they spoke and how they dressed and their accents as well. And this presentation of self was accepted in relation to the notion of credibility and how they would be positioned within the academy as a, a woman of colour. So women were particularly interested and talked about this. Um, and this actually affected how they would be judged by their colleagues and indeed their students. So that presentation of self within the white space of the academy was hugely influential. As is demonstrated here by quotes, as a black woman, I'm aware of how I show myself to the world, how I dress, what I say and how I say it. I'll be judged by all of these things and I have to make sure that I am professional all of the time. But I know that this is, this is not the, always the case for my white colleagues. As a female of colour, I have to ensure I am representing other females of colour. And that means being credible, being professional and being seen in this way. So what was particularly interesting is that my respondents felt as a black woman of, of as a woman of colour, they in some ways represented their whole community or the, their whole ethnic group. And they were under pressure to ensure that they were not seen as aggressive or they were not seen as confrontational. But they, they specifically said this was not the case for their white colleagues. <laughs> 
one of the key issues that arose from the research was the importance of support networks. And this was from both colleagues and peers. And support, as we know, can take many different forms. And for my responders, it was around emotional, academic and instrumental support. And this existed both inside and outside the, the, the academy. And it took different forms. It was either face to face or telephone or indeed Skype interviews. And what was really key is that my respondents said that quite often they did not have access to that, what I call the network of knowns or access to individuals who gave you advice in terms of where you should be publishing, um, where you should be applying for funding, which editorial boards you should be on. So they had that kind of support. And consequently, they felt as though this actually helped them in terms of their successful career trajectories. And the support that they received was, again, something that didn't exist in their own institutions. So I argue this, that, that this notion of support, again, is raced because, again, it depends on that access to the network of knowns that one has. And in some ways, this is the old boys network, white middle class men and indeed women, actually, who control this, these, who are the gatekeepers to success. So the most important type of support that I've had is having access to a couple of experienced professors who've read my portfolio for my full professorship. They've been through the process and can help me improve on what I need to do. And I think that that kind of support is vital. I work in an environment that's predominantly white. And that means that as a female woman of colour, I need to find support networks that understand that I too am a woman of colour who will not be seen or positioned as a white woman or a white man. And that idea and notion of positioning was really, really interesting, particularly around the discursive elements of identity and how those intersectional identities were understood. So quite often it was, there was some of my respondents spoke about black academics who were from middle-class backgrounds, who were from similar backgrounds actually, as their white middle-class colleagues, who were in some ways accepted more because of those intersectional identities and how they played out. So mentoring was also a very important thing that was considered to be important for career progression. Now, what's really interesting is the data that I've looked at recently is that um, there's no obligation on higher education institutions to provide formal mentoring to their to their staff and um, it's it actually varies there's examples of very good practice around mentoring and there's also examples of very bad practice so it's piecemeal so form mentoring can be formal or it can be informal the timing of mentoring is shown to be hugely influential particularly in relation to specific career point points and, and trajectories um, but what was what I found in my research was that respondents themselves, not only did they want to be mentored, but they wanted to mentor junior colleagues themselves because they felt that it was beneficial because they, as academics of colour or black academics, had experienced huge disadvantages in their own careers. And one of the issues also that, that I discuss in the book is that mentor, you don't have to be, respondents said they didn't have to be mentored by somebody who is from the same ethnic group as themselves. Some felt it was beneficial, but however, some felt that this wasn't, the, always didn't have to be the case, as long as there was this understanding around racism and a, an acknowledgement of it. So we have se several mentoring programmes here and they've been really good. I was given a mentor who's the same, who's in the same faculty as me and who understands some of the issues and also my research area. And that works in a great way for me. If my mentor was from a different faculty, I don't think that would work for me. There needs to be some common understanding. And then another, uh, another academic said, I wanted to ensure that when I was mentored, I could understand um, and empathize. For many women of color, their experiences are very different because they are disadvantaged. So it's better to have somebody who can actually understand this. So there were some uh, very disappointing stories around career promotion and progression. Many of the academics I spoke to said that they reached a particular level, usually reader level or um, associate professor level where they, their career hit the buff buffers. Promotion was seen as, as an illusion. It, their promotion prospects were actually limited. And they also felt that whilst on the one hand, we know that there are specific criteria that have to be met for, for uh, promotion. There was a lack of transparency in this area. There was a nebulous criteria and quite often individuals were put forward by promotion because they had positive relationships with their managers or their colleagues. So they were judged on, on their personalities rather than 
their professional outcomes. So rather than their um, journal, journal, journal publications or their grants or their impact, etc. And academics felt that they were judged far more harshly compared to their white colleagues. And there was a, there was a process of both surveillance and hyper surveillance. So they were insiders and outsiders in relation to this identity. And some of the academics, though not all of them, were, were working on issues around race, ethnicity and social justice. And when, when BME academics did this work, this race was seen as personal research. It was seen as deficit and not judged in the same, same way as other pieces of research were judged. Um, and in, in relation to looking at the research excellence exercise, um, there was a representation of publications around the Anglo-American world, which were judged more favorably compared to those academics who were, say, carrying out research in the, Afri in Af in the African continent or indeed in India. So there was this notion that in some ways, uh, white privilege was dominant. And indeed, within that, there was a notion that excellence was defined as Eurocentric. So if you it, you kind of get to a certain point in your career when you really want to progress and it's, kind, and it's kind of your career hits a brick wall, you don't know what to do. For us as people of color, it's much harder. It's that additional thing of, will I be accepted by my peers as an equal? If you're conducting and writing about racial injustice or other types of inequalities and you're a black person, it's not seen as proper research. It's seen as being personal and not judged as objective. That makes it harder to get further in your career if your research is not valued. So um, exclusion and marginalization was a key feature, particularly around looking at racism, and this took different forms, um, covert and overt. And what was interesting here is that the respondents talked about racism, not just from their colleagues, but also actually overt racism from their students, which in some cases was very difficult, particularly if, if um, there was a relationship with that student as, as a professional relationship. There was also a lack of representation at senior decision making levels and particularly around professorial roles were reinforced as being offered. So there was because the, at the beginning there weren't that many professors, this the whole notion of whiteness re, and white privilege was reinforced. So it was like a, a almost what I call a cycle of privilege. And this was no, uh, around uh, the acceptance and cred credibility of colleagues. And when individuals did make complaints about racism, these were often dismissed as a clash of personalities and not taken on board. And there were issues around the, the, the victim becoming the villain. So that was really, really important. So the person that made the complaint, it, they then were blamed for making the complaint. And I remember one academic saying, to me, well, actually, when I made the complaint, I, I was told, well, perhaps it's your teaching that you need to question. Um, perhaps it's, it's, it's the way you carry out your professional duties. So there was this notion of a denial of racism that our organisation could not possibly be racist. So this discourse of denial existed throughout this notion of reinforcing and perpetuating whiteness and white privilege. So it's subtle, it's not overt. So you can't see it or you can't prove it. You can't bring it out or challenge it. It's not tangible. So how do I challenge that? It makes it harder when you feel it's racism, but you can't prove it. They see me as a black male and they, so they judge me based on that. They judge me based on a stereotype and all their views. And then they go back to that stereotype. So you find yourself always having to ensure that you are reacting to that stereotype because you don't want to be defined by it. And finally, I am constantly aware of being an outsider. So this is my last slide. So how can we go forward? I mean, I've, I said at the beginning that there's a huge amount of evidence to tell us. We know that there's a huge different processes of racism and exclusion that exists in higher education. So these are my recommendations where we need a greater visibility of black and minority ethnic staff in academic and decision making roles. I am not suggesting a favourable treatment. I am suggesting a target system for black and minority ethnic staff in senior roles. Um, we cannot have a quota system in this country because quota systems are illegal. So we should have target systems. We need every university should have a formal networking process in place which should be developed in discussion with BME academics. We should have a compulsory mandatory unconscious bias training, particularly or at least for those at level six 
um, on promotion and recruitment panels. However, as a footnote, I will say I have a real problem with uh, unconscious bias training, and perhaps we can discuss that later on. Um, every university um, should provide annual reviews of their targets and clear plan plans. I know that they do that now, um, but however, this needs to include a target system, particularly in relation to staff and indeed students, and what that university is doing in terms of admitting more students from BME back backgrounds, particularly elite higher education institutions, such as the Russell Group and Oxbridge. Now, what's really interesting is that when it was announced um, by Sally Davis, who was the head of the National Institute of Health Research, that the Athena Swan Charter would be linked to biomedical funding. So any institution that was not signed up to the Athena Swan would not be able to apply for funding. The number of applications, uh, sorry, the number of institutions that signed up to that award increased by 400% within a week. So, let's link the race equality charter mark to funding. So any institution that isn't signed up to the race equality charter mark should not be allowed to apply for any form of funding. So rather than individual institutions or senior managers who are really passionate about race being the only ones who are members of the race equality charter, I argue that every single institution must be a member. So if I look back at my numbers, there are only 75 race equality charter members out of what 160 higher education institutions in the UK. I'm afraid that isn't good enough. We also need government policy making. Now, I hesitate when I say this, given the current rhetoric and discourse around the government, around the refusal of accepting that institutional racism exists. But we, you know, let's be hopeful. We need national government policies which will recognise and and apply to all higher education institutions about the importance of addressing race and racism. And finally, what we need, and I know, you know, this may sound rather um, simple, but all higher education institutions must acknowledge and accept the existence of race, institutional racism and white privilege and how it operates in their own organisations and indeed how it affects staff and students because a failure to acknowledge racism results in a failure to act upon it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Carl Hunt. Um, the research you've shared with us I think is extremely important. It's fascinating to hear you describe it but it's also of course very difficult to hear for universities that have a self-image of being progressive and inclusive where clearly the research uh, indicates a uh, very significant failure um, around uh, institutional racism in, in particular and, and all that goes with that. Um, we have some time for uh, Q&A. I'm pleased to say that we've lots of questions coming into the Q&A box. Um, so I might just put some of those to you, Calvin, if, that, if that's okay. Um, so based on the findings from this fascinating study, one of our participants asks, if you were to recommend three key actions, uh, what would they be? Well, you've, you've given us uh, six sets of actions on, on your slide. Maybe, maybe you could pick out one that might be the most important. If we would start in one place, what would it be? Okay, that's a really good question. Thank you for that. So I will go back to linking the race quality charter mark to funding. So I would argue that every higher education institution <laughs> must sign up to the race equality charter. And this, this cannot be a rhetoric it has to result in actions. So it's not just a question of signing up to it, it's a question of using it to make changes within their own organisation. Because, I, I mean, you know, money doesn't talk, money screams, right? Uh, and so if it's linked to funding, I think the number of in institutions that will sign up to it within a week will be like the Athena Swan, it will go up by 400%. Thanks, another question. Fascinating research, thank you for sharing. How did you apply, um, so the question just disappeared from my screen, I've got it. How did you apply the intersectional framework in your analysis? Did you take into account other identities such as class, sexual orientation and so on? Yes, thank you for that. That's a really good question. So um, I work on, I, a lot of my work is uses critical race theory and draws on the work of intersectionality develop, as developed by Kimberly Crenshaw. So what was really interesting about this study is when I asked individuals about their social class background, many of them had said that they were 
originally from working class backgrounds, but now they felt that because they were academics, they were middle class. And often I asked them about their parental backgrounds as well. So I did take into account that. I also took into account age, actually. Um, sexuality, many of the respondents were actually quite, um, they were, they were they were not very willing to reveal their sexuality. So I looked at gender, I looked at class and I looked at age. And I also looked at the number of years that individuals had been working in higher education because had, that had an impact in terms of their career tra trajectory. So I was particularly interested in their career trajectories from the beginning to reaching or uh, wanting to reach professorial level. So it's an interesting policy question here, important question for Ireland, I think. So on the last point about the Race Equality Charter, um, do you have concerns about the Race Equality Charter as it is currently modelled? What are the, your thoughts on having a single charter instead of separate charters for gender and race? Okay, that's a really good question because um, it's very... It, if we look at the Equality Act, for instance, what the Equality Act did when it was introduced in 2010 was it brought together all the single different acts into one act. OK, so we had the Race Discrimination Act, we had the Sex Discrimination Act, so that was brought in together. Now, the de what I argue in my work, that what the Equality Act has actually done is diluted the importance of race. So I don't think that we should have one single charter mark because what will happen there, as I've argued elsewhere, is that other inequalities will be given pro prominence and that will be always be gender. Historically, that will always be gender and that, that is what will happen again. But at the same time, we have to be very careful that we, we are not creating a hierarchy of oppression through this, what I call a discourse of denial. Um, and so historically, we know that gender has taken precedence over race. So I think that we should continue to stick to the Race Equality Charter as a separate charter, but at the same time, be mindful of the challenges that it poses. But it cannot be a tick box exercise, okay? It has to result in real actions. Okay, I've got two questions here that are slightly related. One is about whether allyship training would be helpful. And the second um, says that the participant was pleased to see the emphasis placed on support networks and mentoring. I was wondering about mutual support for other minority groups, for example, LGBTQI plus colleagues or colleagues with accessibility issues. Should we be working towards greater intersectional support between all of the minority groups so it will be strength in numbers and strength in diversity? And then slightly separate from that, I suppose, should we also be working harder around allyship? Okay, that's again, really fantastic questions. Um, so yes, of course, we should be working towards um, white allyship. And I, and from my own personal experience, you know, it's really, really important to have white allies. And it's really, really important that we work together collegiately and collaboratively. So I know, for instance, that some of the things that I argue, if they are argued by a white man, they would be seen differently and they would be judged differently. So of course it's really important to have that white allyship, but it has to be done in a certain way that it's sensitive to the needs of individuals. And number two, yes, of course it's important to look at other inequalities and intersectionalities um, around disability and sexuality, as you've mentioned. However, I, I still think that the danger of, of bringing these all together is that race will be left off the agenda. So Thanks. I'll keep arguing for that because historically that's the case. So a piece of research that um, I'm carrying out at the moment is where you have under the umbrella of equality and diversity, gender and sexuality and other issues are given prominent prominence, particularly in relation to funding and race gets left off the agenda. We have to be careful. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So I've got a question about whether you could elaborate a little bit on your difficulties with unconscious bias training. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> OK, so, um, yeah, I have a real problem with unconscious bias. So, first of all, the name, I think, is incorrect because I think it lets white people off the hook because it kind of says, well, actually, yeah, I'm a bit racist, but it's in my unconscious mind. So I'm not going to take responsibility for it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there is this assumption that um, once you've done mandatory, once you've done mandatory unconscious bias training, you are no longer racist. OK, you've left racism behind so you can move on. And secondly, there's a notion that a one off training package will just absolutely make everything fine and dandy and that we no longer have racism. So for it to be effective, it must include, as your uh, 
the, the individual who asked, colleague who asked the question on white allyship, it should also include white privilege, institutional racism and how that works, structural racism and in, individual racism. And it cannot be a one-off. It must be something that you do either annually or every six months. So whilst I'm very critical of it, it's a way forward. It's something. Yeah. I'm taking notes of your answer on that because that would, <laughs> what you suggest there would provide a very good way forward for us where unconscious bias training has been controversial in the university, but with that broader canvas and of course with the repetition and iteration uh, around it, um, it could play more of a role, I think, in contributing to a cultural uh, and behavioral change. I've got a couple of questions in the chat I'd like to put to you. Um, the first is about mentoring, um, to highlight the importance of mentoring. Would you be able to say, is there a particular stage in career when mentoring is most important? Yeah, I think that um, from my research, obviously that's a very individual subjective thing, but I think from my research, what I found, what my um, respondents were saying was when they got to level six, which is say reader or senior lecturer, and then the next hurdle up is to be a professor. Um, and what they found was that there was, that is the most important point at one's career where, where one needs mentoring because getting from a reader to a professor is very different from getting from um, getting to senior lecturer. So it's at that juncture, if you like, that's really, really important because there are ways in which one has to behave and there are also boxes that have to be ticked. So I would argue that that is the most important. And, and one of the things that I also recommend um, very quickly that's been really influential that one of my respondents spoke about is um, this mock interviews that individuals had. So when they reached that, when they said that, okay, they, they're going for their professorship and they've got an interview, they actually had a mock interview with somebody who had already had that interview and they knew what they had to go through. And they also had somebody to look at their CV. So there was, it was almost like a, a part of the mentoring process. And I, and I think that that has shown to prove and to be work really well. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in mock interviews. I think they're, they're a really important thing. And as a duty, on us all who have experience to, to give mock interviews to people because um, it won't work unless we all engage and participate in sharing our, our experience. And one last question to, to put to you, uh, Carwin. Um, Ireland is behind the UK in understanding the colonial legacy that has shaped our universities, although this reflection has begun. Could you say anything about the relationship between the decolonization process and your recommendations for future actions? Yeah, that's a fantastic question again. I mean, all really brilliant questions. And it's a really good question because I think that, um, as I was saying to you at the beginning, Colin, you know, since last year and the tragedy of, uh, of the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, we've had this huge eruption or explosion around race being brought to the, um, in the popular discourse and in media and our understanding of it. And one of the ways that universities have tried to address that is to through decolonizing the curriculum. Now, I think this is fantastic and it's a positive way forward. But in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, I don't think that this is just adding black scholars on reading lists. It's not about that. That, that isn't decolonizing the curriculum. It's about having a discourse and narrative in terms of understanding the colonial and imperial and oppressive past that universities themselves have played in, in, in their legacies, okay? Particularly, I mean, we, we saw what happened with um, in Bristol with the Edward Colston statue and so on and so forth. So how universities themselves have been built, where they got their money from, and there's a recognition of that. And, you know, these are really difficult conversations, um, but we, we need to have them. And we need to look at how, what we include in our curriculum, who's teaching that curriculum, how we understand that curriculum. But I think before, before there's um, any way forward, we must recognise the imperialist, colonialist, oppressive past of higher education institutions. And, and, and I think that is going to be difficult for some. Thanks very much, Carwin. So we've, we've had lots of questions put and you've addressed many of them. In fact, you've addressed, I think, most of the themes raised in the questions, so I haven't been able to put all the questions to you in the, in the time we've had. But it's been a really stimulating, I think also very challenging session for us, but one I hope that we'll be able to take the learning from and, and the reflection from. So we're very grateful to you, Carl, for being with us you know, today for this. Um, Thank you so much. And we have to engage in the future as we